What's up everybody? Welcome back party people. It has been a while since I've recorded anything. So we are going to be talking about the parable of the unforgiving servant today. So I'm just going to jump in and uh, let's get started. So this is in Matthew chapter 18 verse 21 through 35. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant came out, he found his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. I have totaled multiple cars driving around town. I have totaled at least three cars three cars that I've totaled. Two of them were pretty notable. The first time I totaled a car, I rear-ended a truck. I was in a really old Chevy Lumina. It was just an old, uh, you know, four-door sedan. And I bumped into this truck. And the only damage in this accident was a a dent on the bumper uh, of the truck. And then my car had a busted headlight and some scratches on the quarter panel on the front quarter panel because I'd kind of turned a little bit right at the last second and, you know, hit this guy. But it totaled the car. I had this cheap Chevy Lumina and that little bit of damage totaled the vehicle. Then later on, I had a Ford Focus. It was the first car I purchased all by myself. And uh, I was driving this thing, zipping around to work and I was uh, a little bit late, but I wasn't, I, you know, in this particular instance, I actually, wasn't going crazy fast. I was going a few miles per hour over the speed limit because this section of road that I was driving was really dangerous. There were tons of people who would make crazy left-hand turns. And I saw up ahead a car and it was a little old lady. I could see a little old lady in a car and I thought, okay, she's not going to turn now. I looked down to the radio, I look up and I just boom, plowed right into her. And as her airbag came down, the airbag had blood on it, her face had blood on it. I thought, oh my gosh, I just killed somebody's grandma. I felt awful. And surveying the damage, it was massively uh, damaged. My Ford Focus, the engine pushed the firewall and the dashboard up, like it hit hard. Even though I knew it wasn't 100% my fault that she had made this illegal left-hand turn, and I felt awful. So I think this parable is showing us two ditches we have to avoid. Just like the fender bender in the beginning, the story that I told at the beginning, we can tend to minimize the amount of our own sin or the damage that's there. We, we can kind of go into the ditch of trying to say, well, we're pretty much just good enough. It's not that big of a deal. And we see that with the servant minimizing his own debt that was a lifetime's worth of wages and going after the other servant. And I think the other ditch that we can get into is that we can think we're irredeemable. Like the second wreck, my car was beyond a doubt totaled. There was no way I was getting that back. God never totals us out. He has promised that he can redeem anything. And he does when we turn to his forgiveness and extend that to other people. And so I think those are the two ditches that we need to avoid. And that led me to three points that I want to cover today. So as we go through this parable, we're going to talk about how we can trust how valuable we are to God. We're going to talk about how we can trust in God's judgment and how that means that we can also trust in his promises. So for the first part, uh, we can trust that we are precious to God, that he values us. Uh, In this parable, it starts off 
that the king is settling accounts and he goes to the servant and the servant gets on his knees and, and pleads with him, I don't have what you owe, but please give me some more time. And what does the king do? So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. The king allows the servant to go on. He allows him to be forgiven. He sets this guy free. He doesn't demand payment. So I was clearing out my desk drawer not too long ago and I found this little bead bracelet that my daughter had made and a bookmark that my son had made. And I, I looked at the, these things and I, I thought, man, why, why, do I, why do I still have these, right? And it, well, I have them because my children made them. And so even though these things are, you know, small tokens, they're small reflections of who they are, they're small reflections that they cared enough to make something for me. Well, that's kind of like what God does to us, right? Actually, not at all. We are created in God's image. We mess up. We sin. We are broken. God created us, and we turn ourselves into little macaroni noodle drawings that he can hang on the fridge, right? But God doesn't just think that that's okay. He doesn't want us to be imperfect creations. He wants us to be perfected. He cares about his creation enough to send his son to die for us. That's, that's the gospel message. There's forgiveness all throughout this passage. In the same way that I cherish things that my kids make, even though they're one billionth, right? Like putting it mildly, they're a billion. Like that bookmark that my son made is nowhere near as valuable as my son is, but I still cherish that thing. Those things that they made are just such a dim reflection of who they are, but even that dim reflection is life-giving to me when I take that out and I look at it. When we look at Genesis 1:27, where it talks about the creation of man, we are created in the image of God. Male and female, God created them. In his image, he created them. We get a fuller picture of this with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians talks about this quite a bit. And so I'm going to reference a section in Ephesians that I think is helpful to understand this. But we're going to go straight to Ephesians 1. And in Ephesians 1, 4, it says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So God has had a plan this entire time to take us, the macaroni drawing version of himself, and elevate us to... Uh, to glory, to bring us up out of our sinful nature and into his glory so that we can partake in that with him. Like I said, I'm going to be using Ephesians to explain this a little bit more, but in Ephesians 1.11, it says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. God is transforming us, imperfect creatures, into something that can truly glorify him and be present with him. Despite being sinful in nature, despite being dead in our sin, despite being children of wrath, God wants a relationship with us. We, we can see throughout the Bible how God is fulfilling his plan to glorify himself and to bring us along for the ride. Hey, I want to take a break real quick. I love that you're tuning in. I love that you're watching these videos. Thank you. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. You know, I really appreciate the support. And also, I'm going to take this opportunity to say that if you're hungry for learning the Bible, if you're this far into the video, I'm guessing you are, then please make sure that you're plugged into a local church. I get caught up in learning a lot online, but I still wanted to take this time to say that you need to get connected to the body of Christ. So please find a local congregation if you don't have one. Find a local church. If you're having trouble finding one, put a note in the comments or something, and, you know, uh, we can help get you hooked up. But everybody should be in the body of Christ going to church as often as they possibly can, worshiping on the Lord's day. We can also trust, because we are children of wrath, that God's judgment is imminent. Just like the first car wreck I talked about, the little fender bender, where I thought there's no way this is going to total my car. We often try to minimize the impact of our own sin in our own life. We often try to think that's not worthy of hell. That's not worthy of judgment. 
I'm practically a good person. I'm much better than those people over there. But that's not how it works at all. Every single person is born into sin nature. In fact, even if you never had a little fender bender, just the wear and tear of driving off the lot is, is just even that is unacceptable to God. God is holy and perfect. He cannot tolerate any sin. And this is basic stuff, right? Like this is Christianity 101. But the fact is that we are horrible about minimizing sin and this idea that humans are basically good and we don't really deserve hell has crept into secular culture in a big way. And I also see this coming into the church in affirming culture and different things. But the fact is that we are sinful and that there it's in our nature itself. Even, like I said, if we had never had a little fender bender, we would still be stuck in our sinful nature and imperfect. We would not be able to bridge the gap to get to God. In Ephesians 2... Paul goes on and he says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, and the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So this idea of judgment, we often try to shy away from it. We often try to minimize it. We often try to you know, just pretend like we don't have to talk about that part of the Bible. But because we're children of wrath, it's an imminent thing that we have to deal with. This parable is about judgment and about whose standard we are going to use for that judgment. We see the parable approach the, or we see the parable uh, in the parable that the servant approaches the king and the king says, you owe me, pay up. The servant immediately begs for forgiveness. He's broken. He is losing everything that he has, and the king takes pity on him. That is one standard that we're presented with. On the flip side of that, when that servant turns around, he doesn't use that standard against his fellow man, does he? He goes to another servant, and he demands payment immediately. He says, you owe me, and not even to mention like the amount of the first servant, the, the, the one that is unforgiving, the amount that they talk about is like a lifetime's worth of wages. So this king has forgiven him a lifetime's worth of wages, and he's going to a week's worth of wages to this other guy and saying, you owe me this, and demanding that he pay it, or he's going to go to jail. So even disregarding the, the magnitude of what, they're, what the individuals are asking here, the fact that he is so unforgiving shows that he's actually, he wants one standard for himself and he wants a different standard for somebody else. I deserve forgiveness, but those people deserve to burn in hell. The fact is, no matter what we think about it, God's idea of judgment is better than ours. We often hear as Christians that I I can't believe in a God that would send people to hell. Really? Well, people, let's look at how we use our judgment, how we punish people. We put people in jail. We put people in jail unjustly. We have two-tiered justice systems. We have all different kinds of issues. And this is in America, which has one of the best justice systems ever devised in the history of the planet. Even in that system, we can't prosecute every single person that deserves it. There are people that get away. There are people that are imprisoned wrongly. There are people that don't get due process of the law. And again, this is in one of the best justice systems in the history of the world. It's practically the best that humans can come up with. And it pales in comparison to God's. As we see in this parable, there is actually forgiveness that is undeserved. So this parable is about an option of whose standard of justice you can take on for yourself. You can either serve God and be cheerfully obedient to him and receive that forgiveness as well as give that forgiveness out. Or you can choose to live by your own standards. And oftentimes I think that people miss the part where God is giving you what you're asking for. If you say, God, I don't want to use your standard, I want to use my standard, then God, even if he says, okay, we'll use your standard, would you measure up? 
to how you judge other people? I doubt that's the case. The king's default mode is to look at somebody who is asking for forgiveness, who knows they've messed up, who's seeking mercy, who's repenting of their behavior. And what does he do? Does he double down on the punishment? He has every right to, but he doesn't. His default is mercy and forgiveness and grace and love. That's what he exhibits to us through his sacrifice of Jesus Christ. On the other hand, we are wicked. Our default mode is self-centered. When the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him. That's our default mode. That's what standard we apply to people around us. And this parable is a reminder that we have choices to make about how we go about extending forgiveness. One last point about this, because it seems to be such a a big deal in culture today. People talking about God's judgment and how, you know, there's this kind of underlying theme here that people don't deserve judgment, that God is unjust if he sends somebody to hell. This is pretty laughable to me. For the majority of human history, we've enslaved other people. We have fought wars. We have killed Uh, There have been societies and cultures that shoot each other for sneakers. We We don't uphold justice. Our justice systems around the world have always been imperfect. And when you look at all the evidence, it's it's overwhelming that people are in general uh, either neutral and choose good sometimes, like even the best case scenario, but that's unbiblical. The the, uh, biblical notion is that people are sinful by nature, that it's actually in your nature. That's obviously what I am asserting here, that we are sinful by nature. There's no breaking out of it apart from turning to God. It's only by God's grace that we can even get out of that broken nature. It's interesting to me that when we break it down on a personal level, it makes perfect sense. You love yourself. You're called to love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, I don't think anybody needs any help learning how to love themselves. I think these whole like self-love things today is just self-idolatry, really. But this is very simple. If somebody stole your car, would you want them to be caught and would you want your car returned? Of course you would, because you know that that is wrong for somebody to take things from you. If you have accidentally wronged somebody, uh, even accidentally, but you've caused them real damages and it was due to negligence on your part, you would be terrified that they would take something of yours from you to even make that right. And it's even simpler than this. When I see my kids playing around and my son accidentally hits my daughter, and causes her pain, there is a very guttural response to these types of incidents, even within your own kids, your own family. We instinctively want justice for people who have been wronged. We, as people, are incapable of providing an outside look at the cosmos and at our individual lives and ascribing uh, or, or prescribing true justice. We are almost incapable of applying a standard that we don't influence. God can. Once we get over this hurdle and actually just start to think about how we are as people, I think it's abundantly clear that God has every right to punish us for the evil things that we do. And instead, he poured out his wrath on Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself on a cross for our sins, which brings us to the third point, which is that we can trust in God's promise of forgiveness. Just as in the Lord's Prayer, it says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. In this parable, we see again the king calling a servant in who owes him more than he could ever hope to repay in his lifetime, demands that he be sold, his family sold, him put into prison until he can attempt to repay it. The man begs for forgiveness and it is given. That is a gift that we squander all too often these days. You'll remember that actually in the beginning, it was Peter that came up to him and said, you know, Lord, how often will my, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? So Peter's asking like, how often, how often do I really have to forgive my brother? 
Jesus is exceptionally clear about how we're to forgive without limit. This idea of 70 times 7 is just completely, it, uh, 7 is a number of completeness. So even symbolically, this ties into just not 490 times, just keep doing it. So what? If we are called to forgive people around us, then what does that mean for us? Let's start off with some softballs here. Let's start off by just teeing it up, all right? Let's talk about your family. If you're a millennial like me, then you're raised with this idea of uh, equality and everything and complementarianism in the church and all these different ideas about men and women being completely equal. And they, they are not. Men and women are different. And I think that when you hear what I'm about to say, uh, you'll agree that it's not always in our favor either. This is pretty rough, but a lot of men today are feeling, and they understand this intuitively, that they need to man up, but they don't know what it looks like. They really don't know what biblical masculinity looks like. I'll be honest, it's difficult as a man to figure out. Uh, I grew up in the church, and I didn't always have an understanding of what covenantal headship meant. But as a man, when you m get married and have a family, you are the covenant head of your family. You take responsibility for your family. We see this actually in the parable. The king is talking to the servant, and he says, you know, when the servant can't pay, since he is the head of his family, in fact, because of his bad decisions and him taking responsibility for that, it's not just him that has to be uh, taking responsibility. He's a servant. He's a slave. His whole family is in, in the process of being sold off when he's begging for forgiveness. He's literally losing everything. So this isn't just about you if you are married and have kids. And if you're not married, this is the responsibility that you're stepping into. So what does this have to do with forgiveness? This means that you are in charge of setting an example for your family on how to forgive each other. It is not an equal responsibility you share with your wife. It is not definitely not a responsibility that you share with your kids. You have to shoulder that responsibility and you have to start finding out what true forgiveness is. If your uh, sin of choice is anger, then you need to start not you need to take care of your own sin you need to stop being angry you need to stop being bitter if that's something that you deal with if your wife is angry or bitter you have to help her deal with that and you have to deal with your own sin first and then if she is that way you have to forgive her and if your children are that way you have to show them what it means to forgive there's a really big example of this that i've heard out of uh the moscow church, you know, Pastor Doug Wilson, Toby Sumter, all those guys, but they, they use this concept called keeping short accounts. And I've even heard it, it might go all the way back to Doug's dad, Jim Wilson, but in his book. Uh, there, there's one of the books, and oh man, so I feel bad not, but in one of the books, they talk about keeping short accounts. And as a man, that is your responsibility in your relationships, is to keep short accounts. As soon as you need to ask for forgiveness, then you do that. The minute that you recognize you are angry about something or bitter about something, you need to extend forgiveness. It really is that simple. It's the easiest way for you to take control in your family in a positive way and start being a positive example and a godly example of how your family needs to behave. Take the responsibility. Nobody's going to give it to you. There's a subnote that I'm putting in here because this really stood out to me. It really spoke to me as I was going through this text as a father, as a husband, is, uh, you know, be loving and be forgiving when you're, you know, handing out discipline in your house. When you have children, you need to discipline your kids. That's part of it. I think there are a couple parts of this parable that really stand out for that. One is we talked about the king's standard versus the servant standard. The servant standard was actually harsher than the king's in this instance. The servant actually takes his standard and supplants God's standard with it. The king says, I'm going to be merciful and forgive. And the servant says, I'm not. We need to be very careful when we're disciplining or even when we're, when we're talking with our wife and we have a, a, a conflict or a disagreement, we have to be loving and we have to make sure that we are turning back to God's standard that we're not just getting bitter and annoyed because it's an inconvenience to us. We want to be pouring into our family. Even with discipline, it should be about what is best for them, and it should always use God's standard and not ours. 
And just like the parable says to do, we also need to be forgiving and mindful of that. When we are disciplining our kids, we need to be forgiving. The point is to be reconciled. So you are instituting this parable in your house when you discipline your kids. You as a father are taking responsibility. And so as you do that, you want to do it in a loving way, in a forgiving way, just like the king in the story is giving you an example of how to do it. This was a big aha moment for me, but who are the people in your life that cause you the most pain or the most bitterness? I bet it's not all the people on the news that make you mad. In fact, if I had to guess, it would be your wife, your girlfriend, your mom, dad, brother, sister, whoever it is that you're closest to right now, even your close friends, that if you've ever been hurt by those people, that it stings the most. We often don't harbor bitterness towards people that are you know, out there in the world that are random acquaintances or anything like that. It's really the people closest to us, and we have to be willing to let that go and forgive those people in our life. This is a very difficult situation with people that have harmed you greatly. And I think that one thing that we are called to do is forgive even the worst offenders against us because God commands it. It really is that simple. And God commands us to do what is best for us. Harboring bitterness and hate and resentment towards people, no matter how horribly they have treated you and hurt you, it's not a pass to that person, it is cutting an anchor that can hold you down. Like we know that now, even even like psychology, all this other stuff that's coming along that's that's not biblically based or, or, uh, or based on God's standard is pointing to the fact that forgiveness is good for you. God's commands are not always easy to follow, but they are what's best for us. This leads us to a tougher part of the conversation to deal with, which is loving our enemies. So who do you have to forgive that you think is an enemy of yours? Who are those people that really get you riled up that you just cannot stand when you see something on the news about it or you're scrolling by on Facebook? What are those hot button issues or topics that really get you fired up? I'll go first. Trans activists. How about those? Trans activists and politicians that support, um, the, these initiatives that sexualize children and enable uh, predators to come back into our society or people that are arguing that pedophilia is normalized or that we should normalize these just abhorrent behaviors in culture. How about that? That's a pretty tough one for me. How about, you know, speaking of politicians, I, I know that none of you have issues with politicians on either side. Uh, You know, that's just not a thing, right? Politicians don't make you mad when you read the news or you hear about that stuff. And some of you avoid the news specifically because of this. So I know that it's still applicable to you. But when you hear about these stories of corruption and incompetence and and most of the time both, let's be honest. But uh, it's, it's not exactly inspiring hope in our system. How about the like Trump supporters? Do they make you really mad or the the progressives? and their agenda, and climate change activists, and all those people who disagree with you, you don't get mad at them, right? You don't need to forgive them. You, you, you just are fine. What about Christians? What about those Christians? What about the Christians that completely disagree with you? Are you forgiving them? You know, the ones that are clearly making an idol out of that one thing. Again, not, not the Christians like you, but the, the other ones, the ones that have all the bad theology and all that stuff, right? Again, from Ephesians, I'm going to read... Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So we, in forgiving, uh, I think some of the power comes from the fact that we actually have to confront our own sin. We have to do something with our own sin when we're forgiving other people. In James 1, 19 through 20, it says, Know this, my beloved brothers, Let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the uh, anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. There's nothing about your anger that's going to produce righteousness, and forgiving is what you are called to do. Your anger and lack of forgiveness, your bitterness, whatever emotional response you think it is that's preventing you from forgiving other people, you need to give that to God. You need to confess that sin and get over it. You need to deal with the speck in your, your eye or the log in your eye before you deal with the speck in somebody else's. 
And you can tell me, you know, specs and logs, you know, this, that thing is way bigger than anything I do, right? And I, I, yeah, whatever. But the fact is that you have sin in your life, you need to deal with it. The fact is that your anger is not producing the righteousness of God. Be angry and do not sin. You're entitled to be angry and that's a good motivating thing, but you can't let it eat at you. Saved rounds. This does not mean that you have to be a squishy Christian. In fact, I love uh, listening to Doug Wilson specifically for this and, and other pastors, Vody Bauckham and, and, and others. I do not want you to go to trans weddings. I do not uh, want you to be squishy on morality issues. I don't want you to embrace bad theology. I'm not saying any of that. I'm not saying to tolerate any of that, especially within the church. But what I am saying is that there's a difference between people in the church and outside the church. And the entire point of this parable is that we are called to forgive others the way we want to be forgiven and the way that we are forgiven. If you are a Christian, you have already been forgiven this way. There is no excuse for you to not extend that to everyone in the world. That includes actively praying for and forgiving your enemies. Just as the servant kneeled before the king, if you are in a posture of humility, ultimately, that humility is going to render you completely unable to react to the world, but instead you will be focusing on God and acting towards that end. So as we wrap up, I just want to remind you that the, uh, of a verse in, in Micah that says, it's uh, Micah 7, 18 and 19. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. That's the type of forgiveness that God gives us and we are called to give other people. The type of forgiveness that ultimately forgets, that lets it go, that casts it into the deepest sea. I think we really need to get rid of our anger as a culture. We are divisive. We are divided. We need to start forgiving each other. We need to be examples of that as Christians in the culture. And that does not mean that you give up your backbone. It's not about being Zen and letting everything go and tolerating everything. That's not what I'm saying. But what it is, is it's recognizing when you get bitter and angry and dealing with your sin first and then extending grace to those around you. Even when you disagree, even when, and it's especially tough when you are standing up for what you believe in. If you take nothing else away from this, I hope that you just remember to forgive those closest to you and as fast as you recognize it. As a man leading a family, or, you know, if, if you're uh, a woman listening to this, a wife, whatever it is, a girlfriend looking, whatever, just remember that those accounts need to be as short as possible. There's no reason for you to spend another minute angrier than you have to or more bitter than you have to. You can let it go. God gives you that. It's like a superpower. Remember just to posture yourself with humility. You don't have to keep dredging up your sins. And in fact, I don't think God wants you to. But at the same time, you do need a posture of humility. So you need to approach God with humility, God's word with humility, other people with humility, because we are all, we are all children of wrath. We are all sinners. We need to show people how to forgive in the same way that we have been shown. Finally, I would ask that you get, ask God for the strength to uphold his standards. Again, have a backbone, uphold his standards. Do it unashamed, unashamedly. And while you do that, reflect the grace and forgiveness that God has given you. As Christians, we have a better way and we need to model that to the world with cheerful obedience to God the one thing worthy of our worship, the one thing worthy of all the glory. I'm going to pray. God, thank you for our families, for our jobs, our communities, especially our enemies. Today, we want to thank you for our enemies. We want to have the strength to love them and forgive them. Give us the wisdom to love and forgive without abandoning your standards. There is no hope or love apart from it anyhow. Let us rejoice in the hope you give us in Christ the Lord, who has forgiven us a debt greater than we could ever repay. In Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. Thanks for hanging out today. If you like the new format, tell me in the comments. Put something in the comments that, you, that really stood out for you, and I will catch you in the next video. All right? Peace.